This video will explain how to use Metamorph to image on the iX81. So we've already started up the system. I'm now going to start up Metamorph by double clicking here. Be aware that when we start Metamorph, um, it will automatically change a bunch of things on the microscope and zero the stage. So it'll move the stage uh, to one corner and then to the other to find its calibration. Therefore, uh, it's not a good idea to leave anything, to have a sample on the microscope when you do this. So uh, don't put your sample on yet, just start Metamorph and then put your sample on later. So I'm gonna double click here. That's Metamorph and uh, the startup will take a while because as I said, the stage will move around. It'll change objectives to the 4X if it's not there. Um, I'll um, start the video again once all of those uh, steps are complete. While the startup is taking place, the cursor uh, will be uh, sort of some sort of spinning uh, symbol. When you're complete, you'll have the, the arrow uh, for the cursor, and then you'll see that these items are accessible and no longer grayed out. So um, let's talk about the basics of the Metamorph uh, interface. You can change the objective by clicking here. You can change the illumination, so what filters you're using, by clicking here. You can change the intensity of light that you use to hit the sample by clicking on this. But mostly, the way you are going to navigate in this software is by opening up something called the multi-dimensional uh, acquisition, which is like a little wizard, uh, and then selecting what you want to do and uh, what parameters you want to use for each of the things that you want to do with your sample. So let's go through this uh, one by one. So this will be set to whatever the last person was doing. You can, if you've already used the software, have your own settings, which are called the state in this software, which you save, and once you have them saved, you can load them. So that's highly recommended so that when you start, even if it's set to whatever the last person was doing, you can load a state that is uh, properly set up for what you want to do. So the way this menu works is that there is a main uh, section where you decide at a high level what characteristics the experiment will have. So you can have an experiment which has a time lapse, multiple stage positions, multiple wavelengths, Z-series, and then stream and run journals are more advanced features, and the same goes for hardware autofocus, which is something that you only use when you're doing live imaging. So let's say we want to do the most basic experiment possible, which is to use multiple wavelengths. Depending on what you click here, you will have different options on the left-hand side that you will need to set, okay? Uh, and we'll go over those in a moment. There are other things that you can adjust down here which are the binning. So the one on the left is the binning for when you take images. The one on the right is the binning for when uh, you look at the sample live. And you may want those to be different just for reasons of speed. Uh, usually most people keep them the same. What is the binning? The binning is whether you um, take multiple pixels that are adjacent to each other uh, on, the, on the sensitive element of the camera and then transform them into one pixel in the image. So a binning of four means that four pixels on the camera tur get turned into one pixel in the image. And, and this typically increases your signal to noise, uh, increases your speed, uh, decreases your image size, and does all of those things at the expense of resolution. So if you have bigger pixels, um, you'll have more light, so the signal to noise will be better, um, but your resolution will be worse. So it's typically something that people do when they're starved for photons, for example, during a live cell imaging experiment. So I'm gonna set it for the, for the purpose of this tutorial to just one. Um, these buttons you should not press because they control what part of the camera is being used to image. And the way I have this set up, uh, the proper part of the camera is set to imaging. If you mess with that, um, you may get an image that looks really weird. So my recommendation is don't touch that, okay? 
Um, let's continue. Uh, there are some other buttons that are not relevant right now. Let's continue um, with the different tabs here. So once you've completed what you want to do in main, this sort of sets the general structure of the experiment. Uh, you can either click on different tabs that you want to adjust or just click on next down here to go to the next tab. And so the next tab is saving. Uh, here's where we tell it where we want to save it, what the base name should be, and whether we want to increment the base name if the file exists. So I'm going to select a directory here. I'm going to go to user data. And here's my folder. So I recommend you make a new subfolder uh, for every day that you're imaging because uh, Metamorph generates a lot of files, so you, you want to keep them organized. Okay. Uh, okay, so for some reason that didn't work. Let me try that again. Okay, that's better. All right, for whatever reason, it's not letting me change the name easily. I'm just gonna say new folder, that's fine. Um, I am going to call this test, and I'm gonna leave uh, increment base name if file exists uh, so that I never overwrite my images. So the first one's gonna be test, then test one, test two, etc. So that's it, you just need to you point this at where you want it to save the files and what you wanna call them. Um, so the next, is wavelengths. Uh, so here we set how many wavelengths we want uh, in the image, so how many channels. Uh, I have a slide uh, on, on, uh, that I'm going to put on the microscope that's going to have uh, three channels uh, with fluorophores in the red, green, and blue regions of the spectrum. So I'm going to set that to three. Uh, you can see that when I did that, now I have three options here. We don't want separate hardware autofocus offsets for each wavelength. There's very few conditions under which you want to do that. Uh, allow separate bidding for each wavelength. Typically, you don't want to do that, so I'm going to leave that unchecked as well. And so now, we're going to, for each wavelength, set what kind of filter we want to use, uh, as well as all of these other settings for the, uh, for the camera. So, illumination is basically the filter that we're going to use, and so this depends on the fluorophore we want to use. So this system has many, many, many settings. So let's go over them. Uh, you can see first that there are some settings that say ACQ, which stands for acquisition, and other settings say eyes. Uh, eyes are the settings that you need to use if you want to take a look at it by eye. Acquisition is the, ones you, is the setting you need to use if you're going to look at these things with the camera. Um, you can then see as well that um, there are sort of families of settings which start with, with, with sort of different names. There's fast, there's G slash R, there's fret, there's CFP cube, um, there's Fura. So there are a large number of settings here that are grouped in families. The typical settings that you're going to use uh, are either the fast ones, which cover DAPI, FITSI, Texas Red, Sci 5, and Sci 7. So these are, for, for most examples, you're gonna use some of these or the G slash R, which are for GFP, RFP uh, imaging, okay? So, um, fast DAPI, fast FITC, fast Texas Red, fast Sci 5, and fast Sci 7, uh, these ones, when you click on them, it'll put the proper filter in place, and the intensity of light that illuminates the sample will be whatever it says here. So right now, that's actually 5%. And you can change the intensity by clicking here. So that's one option. Um, another uh, better option is to use a setting that is associated with a particular intensity. So for example, we can use fast, uh, let me start with Texas Red, fast Texas Red 05, that means it's going to put on the Texas Red filter and it's going to make the illumination 5%. Uh, so if instead I use something like fast Texas Red 40, It'll put on the Texas Red filter, but the intensity of the light that hits the sample will be 40% of the maximum, as you can see here. Okay? Um, so, uh, I said we're going to use uh, Texas Red, um, Fitzy, and Dappy. So, I'm going to get those. Let's 
see. Um, one thing that you should avoid is turning the scroll wheel, which is what I just did, uh, because that automatically turns, uh, sort of switches filters. So instead, don't turn it, and then just click on whatever you want. So I'm gonna use 5005, and then, uh, let's see, fast dappy 05. So I always, you always wanna image from far red to blue. All right, so let me go, um, focus on something and then I'll come back and we'll take a look at how we can adjust the settings and, and, and view images uh, on the on the computer uh, let me let me just say one more thing before I do that which is to switch between seeing things by eye and seeing things on the camera we need to press this button this will send the light to the eyepiece this will send the light to the camera so since I'm gonna look on the eyepiece I'm gonna switch it to that uh, take a look uh, on, on a sample, focus, and then I'll come back to the software and, and we'll see um, how to image it. So something else you'll need if you're looking by eye is to know how to turn the shutter on, how to open and close the shutter, and that's going to be this button here. So this, when I click on it and it looks green, that will allow light to hit the sample. If I click it again, it will close the shutter and light will not hit the sample. So this is how we let light go through the sample as I showed you and to the eyepieces to actually see anything. So um, let me find something and then we'll return to the software. So as I was focusing by eye, uh, I um, remember two things that you need to be aware of when you're doing that. Uh, so the first is that uh, every time you switch channels by changing, for example, from fast appy to fast fitzy uh, or whatever it may be, and the shutter will automatically close, so you'll need to open it so that you can see that other channel. The other issue is if you want to use a phase contrast setting, uh, you need to make sure that the objectives are in the phase contrast mode, which are these. So you can select the 10, 20, 40x objectives. If you want to use them in phase contrast mode or in DIC mode, you have to pick the same objective, but in the DIC or phase contrast, so this pH mode. All right. Uh, so I've focused on something with a 20x objective uh, where we should be able to see these three channels. So how do we visualize the sample on the computer? So first we need to make sure that we're sending the light uh, to the camera. And so if you recall, there was a button on the microscope stand. We need to press that and make sure it's in the camera position. I've just done that. Uh, I'm not going to point at it because it's too dark for, for, you, for you to see it in the video. And so now, um, how, how do I get an image on the screen? So there's two things I can do. I can either take a snapshot, which is this camera, or I can take uh, live imaging, which is this camera with this play button. So let me just first take a snapshot. So it came out kind of big. So I'm going to use the scroll wheel to zoom out. And you can see here, these are um, DAPI images. So uh, with, of a, this is a DAPI image of a bunch of nuclei. So how do I adjust this? Uh, this image actually has a lot of information in it. Um, so let me go through the different things in this window that you can use to, to make your life a little bit easier. So first, if you don't like this blue color scheme, you can go here. Let's see if I can place this in a way that um, the video comes out a little bit better. There we go. So you can go here, and if you click there, you can set this up in a monochrome scale, which is often uh, easier to interpret. Um, another piece of information in this image is the following. If you look here, you'll see that uh, there is something that looks like a histogram on its side, and then the, there's sort of a lookup table and some sliders. So what's all this? So this uh, display window in Metamorph automatically shows you a histogram of the image. So this image has many, many different pixel intensities. Uh, if you put all those pixel intensities into a histogram, you'll get this, uh, which is the histogram sort of tilted on its side. And the bottom here, so this level here is zero. And then if you keep going up, this level here, so the very top of that, is 2 to whatever power this is, so four, 2 to the 14. Uh, that seems a little confusing. Why would, would it be 2 to the 14 and not some arbitrary number? 
And the reason is uh, metamorph adjusts, it, adjusts this dynamically so that the histogram, so you can see the shape of the histogram uh, depending on how bright an image is. And you can see it has different ranges. There's the 8-bit range, which is 0 to 255, the 10-bit, the 12-bit, the 14-bit, and the 16-bit. So this camera is 16 bits. Uh, so that means that it could theoretically go up to 0 to 65,000. We have it set in best fit range, means that, meaning the software is always trying to just make this number and adjust the histogram uh, in, a, in a way that uh, is sort of more comfortable. Um, and we'll, we'll explore that in a second. The other thing is that this is on auto scale, which means that the software is adjusting how the image looks so that it has a reasonable brightness, okay? So let's see, uh, let's make a few changes and see how this, uh, how this changes in turn. So you can see that uh, the DAPI uh, is at, uh, we have fast DAPI 5% and we have an exposure of 20. So if we decrease the exposure to let's say five, the expectation is the image we get, uh, the actual pixel values will be lower. So therefore this histogram will be shifted down it, this might change because we, it might shift it so far down that we fall into a different bit range. But because we have auto scale on, the contrast, the, the brightness should look similar. However, because of the low exposure, the noise might be higher. So that's a lot of things. Again, so what are the predictions? The actual pixel values will get lower. The image here should look similar, though perhaps noisier, similar in brightness, uh, perhaps uh, noisier um, in terms of quality. And this histogram has to shift because the actual pixel values will change. So let's see what happens. So if I click on snap, you'll see now that the image looks very similar to before. The histogram looks similar, but if you look here, we're now on the 12-bit scale, meaning these values are now around 800 whereas before they were larger. So what if we go in the other direction? So what if instead of an exposure of five, I have an exposure of 500, and then I take an image? So now if we look here, what we see is uh, the image brightness looks similar, but now we're on the 16-bit scale. And in fact, our pixel values, This remember this is a histogram, we have pixels that are all the way at the edge of the 16-bit scale. In fact, if we increase this even further, what we expect to happen is for a bunch of pixels to accumulate in the, at the last possible intensity they can have, so at the maximum intensity they can have. So let's double the exposure and see if that's true. Uh, that didn't quite do it. Uh, let me do this. I will increase the intensity to 99%. So it's hard to see here, but when you do that, um, sometimes what occurs is that you see an accumulation of pixels in this very brightest bin. Let me see if I can get that. Let's do a five second exposure, just so you can see it, so you know what to expect if you have saturation. Right, so now we can see that. Um, there's a tiny little smidge of a, of a peak there. That's because we're accumulating pixels uh, that are very bright. So usually this camera has such a large dynamic range, it's a 16-bit camera, that we never run into that situation. Uh, more typically what we want to do is get the minimal exposure that gives us the signal to noise that we care about, uh, that, we, that we're, we're comfortable with. And so in this case for the DAPI, even something like five milliseconds at 5% imaging, at 5% uh, power, uh, gave us something that would have been recognizable as DAPI. And if we do something like 50 milliseconds of exposure, which is very brief actually, we have an image of pretty acceptable quality. So what if we want to do this dynamically instead of sort of taking snapshots? The advantage of taking snapshots is that we only take one image at a time. So if bleaching is a concern, uh, 
we're controlling it much more because we're only taking illuminating the sample when we hit the snapshot button. But, but maybe we want to do things more dynamically and so we can uh, focus. And so if you want to do that, you can click on live. So now if you look at these, um, if I adjust the focus, let me see if I can move this a little bit up and down. You can see there it's out of focus, there it's in focus, and you can see that when you're out of focus, the pixel values go down. And when you get in focus, they typically go up. All right, you can see that from the histogram moving on the, on the left. You can also see that because this is on auto scale, the brightness of the image is actually always the same. Uh, not because the actual intensity of the image is the same, just because that auto scale is on. And that helps us when we're out of focus, uh, particularly on, this, uh, on a system with a camera that has this high a dynamic range. If we turn that off, uh, it might be hard to see things. So let me show you what that looks like without it. Um, so if you were even a little bit out of focus, you might not be able to see anything. And so then you, it would be very hard to know which direction to go in. Whereas if we turned auto focus on, uh, auto scale on, excuse me, uh, we can always see something. And so it, it's very useful to have that on uh, by default. All right, um, once we're done, we can press this button to turn it off. The other option is we can press F2 and that will also turn off the live imaging. When we turn off the live imaging, uh, that window will disappear. So uh, as far as settings go, we pick whatever illumination we want. Uh, the digitizer should be set to high precision and we pick an exposure that gives us an, a, an adequate signal to noise in an adequate amount of time with little bleaching. So how would we tell if there's bleaching? If we, for example, set the exposure, um, I'm actually just going to leave it at whatever it was, uh, and we go to live, if there is bleaching, then the, the intensities of the image should go down. So this histogram should trend down because this these are the brightest pixels this is sort of the right edge of the histogram so if there's bleaching that should get uh lower and lower that's not happening uh, that's not surprising there's a fixed sample in, in a pretty good mounting media uh, but if that does happen that tells you that there's bleaching all right um you can play games where uh if you want a lower exposure uh you can increase the illumination to compensate uh, for the lower exposure and get sort of the same quality in a smaller amount of time. Um, so let's see, um, the DAPI is kind of a little bit boring. Let's see if we can see uh, another channel and adjust it for that one. We're not gonna really uh, use auto expose or auto focus or alignment cropping. So um, I'll ignore those. Let me go back to Fitzy here. Okay, so. This is the Fitzy channel. You can see that it's very, very noisy. That's because the exposure is five milliseconds. So let's see if I set it to 50 milliseconds. That's much better. It still has some noise. Uh, what if instead I set it to 200 milliseconds? So now it looks pretty good, but if I wanted the image to be taken much faster, what I could do is instead of setting it to 200 milliseconds, I could set it to 50 uh, and increase this to 20 and i should have an image of similar quality but in a fraction of the time so you can see how you can play with these two settings to get uh images of similar quality but in different amounts of time depending on how fast you want things to go um finally let's go to the texas red and so this channel is much dimmer so we can use the full blast of the led and uh, adjust as needed, uh, adjust the exposure as needed to get a good image. So let me see here, for example, if I set this to 250. So that right there is a pretty decent image uh, in this channel. Uh, so that's how you set uh, the wavelengths. If you're in a situation where, um, for example, you're looking at nuclei that have uh, a structure in 3D, which is sort of like a sunny side up egg, so that most of the cell is on one plane and the nucleus is in another, you can go to the nuclear channel, for example this, and adjust the Z relative to wavelength one. So you can put it in a slightly different Z so that picture will be uh, in the middle of the nucleus instead of the edge. If you wanna do that, let me know and I will show you how. Uh, it's a little bit tricky uh, to show this in a video, uh, but just know that that option is there. Okay, so let me turn live off. 
so we've gone through saving, we've gone through wavelengths, we've gone, uh, now we need to go to display. So I usually leave this as default. This just tells you what it's going to show when it's acquiring the image. I always recommend you go to summary because this will tell you where it's going to save things uh, and what the settings are gonna be. So you can double check that everything is set how you want it. Uh, once you're happy with everything, if you hit acquire, it will actually take the images. So let's do that. So you can see it takes a Texas Red image, a Fitzy image, the Dappy, and then it shows you the composite. That's because of the display settings that I had. And if you look at the folder where those uh, files ended up, you'll see, let me see if I can show you, uh, user data, Pablo, new folder, which for whatever reason I couldn't name what I wanted. Uh, there we go. And so the way these uh, files are saved, it saves one uh, image per channel, per time point, per position. And it makes ZStacks uh, one image. So if we had done ZStacks, there would be still be three image images, excuse me, here, uh, but each of them would be much bigger. And then it saves this ND file. And it's critical that you keep track of this ND file uh, and keep it with this because this is the file that if you drag into Fiji, uh, Fiji will understand uh, how these images were taken. So let me show you what I mean by that. Um, this is the raw data here, but this is what has uh, the metadata so for Fiji to understand it. Let's see if we can open this here. So if I drag that ND file into Fiji, it'll automatically open up this bioformats. Uh, I don't wanna split the channels uh, here. That's one of the options that I have. I'm just gonna say okay. So now you can see um, that we have an image where Fiji knows that there are three channels. You can see here that it says channel. And um, if you can see up here, it says three channels and there are the names of the channels. It knows the size of the image in microns and in pixels, and it knows it's a 16-bit image. So then we can use the common tools in Fiji to take a look at this. And, and, and the main ones uh, are typically uh, adjust brightness contrast. Oops, excuse me. Which allows us to make things brighter or make the background dimmer. And then the other one, uh, which is very useful is in color, uh, the channels tool. So this allows us to, for example, instead of a grayscale, put them in a color scale and look at various channels by clicking here. And then uh, to look at a composite and then control which combinations of channels are in that composite, okay? So all this to say, keep your ND files together um, with the actual image files, all right? Let's say we are happy with these settings and we want to use them as the basis for any other uh, experiments we do. So then we can save the state. And we'll call this settings, for example. So then if next time we come, uh, you know, someone was doing something very different, maybe they were doing a time lapse, multiple positions, Z, whatever, some weird combination that we don't want, we can just go to load state, select all the settings, say load, and load what we want to do. And there we'll have exactly what we did saving, wavelengths, everything is exactly uh, as we uh, used during the experiment. So that's a, a, a very useful feature that I highly recommend uh, you use. Uh, that concludes the very basics of how to use uh, Metamorph. I have other videos where I'll discuss 
how to do um, Z stacks for wide field deconvolution, uh, as well as uh, random sampling uh, options uh, if you want to take multiple positions in a truly random way so they're representative of your sample.